politics is a very strange game. It's very, very, very inaccessible and it's extremely hard. And that's the beauty of democracy, but also its challenge. There is an idea that politici- politicians don't stick to their truth or they don't tell the truth. That's what, in general, mm-hmm. people feel that way. Is that something that you've had to, to think about when you have a run as well? One of the things I always advise people who want to run, including telling myself, is that, you know, run because you want to do something not because you want to be something. Hi, my name is Abby Sue and welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be talking politics. Um, as part of my master's degree, we had to create a seven minute documentary on a piece that was important to us or that we thought was relevant. And my group decided to do a piece on the rise of BAME Conservative MPs in Parliament as opposed to the amount of BAME candidates. So that's people that are applying for the position. And on that um, journey to create that documentary, we came across Johnny Luck. Johnny was campaigning for a position um, to be the MP for the constituency of Hampstead and Kilburn. Just the experience that we had with him and getting to know him and his campaign team was so good um, that even made me think, oh, it's politics for me. Could I get into politics? We're going to kick off the interview. We'll probably be a part, two, uh, probably, it will probably be two parts um, because you know I love my short videos. So, um, yeah, so let's kick it off. Hi, Johnny. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, gosh, my voice. <laughs> it's like, can you hey, hear me? Sorry. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How has everything been? <laughs> Very well. I like your background, the mandatory bookcase. It's, it's Thank you. Thank you. My, my mum set it up for me. <laughs> Forgive me for using the wardrobe. Basically, um, I live in the studio with my partner and she's on a call there, so I'm here. So Oh, okay. No, don't that. worry. It's fine. It's fine. It's it's the main thing is that we have you, so that's the, the most important thing. Um, okay, so I um I've got some questions for you, but I'm gonna give you a little introduction. Of course. Yeah, and uh, how 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 have you been? No, no, it's okay. Congratulations on your um, submission. I saw. Oh, it. thank it was, you. Honestly, it was, I, it, was <laughs> it was our first time um, doing it, and it was it was quite intense. We never knew how much it took to actually put together a documentary um, mm. and to make sure that we can allow every case study to show that they have you know that we've done them justice <laughs> on the piece um but yeah no, it's, it's we've got the same group so we've got a 30 minute documentary that we have to do now and oh. um, we're in the same group we learn a lot together and um, we wanted to stick together so we're in the middle of recording that now um so yeah nice. it's, yeah it's good <laughs> <laughs> good luck with that um you've got my full support Nice Thank time. you so much. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to just ease us in and ask you three quick questions. Just three quick questions. Um, and then we'll start with the actual interview. So what has been your favourite activity to do during quarantine? During lockdown, what's been your favourite activity? Oh, gosh. Uh, I guess it would probably be running, jogging. Okay. Have you taken part in the five? Is it the five miles or the... This, this charity five mile right race. I, I have not yet because I'm not fit enough to do five miles, I don't think. But I, I will want to, I would, I want, I would like to do some kind of event or charity event. Um, I'm working towards it. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay, good. Um, what is the first place that you would want to travel to after um, the lockdown? And obviously after they say that we can travel. <laughs> well, uh, so I'm supposed to go to a wedding in Switzerland. Um, which was in June, but it's been delayed to August. So okay. if it was possible to go in August, I'd love to do that. If not, well, my, my, immediately I want to see my parents in Milton Keynes. What do you think your greatest personal achievement has been so far? Thus far? Greatest thus far? Um, gosh, I think the one that will affect my life the most in terms of the psychological and physical energy required was probably winning the national schools gold medal in rowing in 2009 so that was accumulation of five years of training four hours a day six days a week probably sacrificing my gcse's and a levels to achieve it so and losing in 2008 the year before because our boat sank so oh my god yeah so i think probably that and that has carried that spirit of um determination has carried throughout my life so yeah I'll read that. <laughs> okay, 
okay well that that makes sense because with the determination that you've had to do with the uh campaigning it basically <laughs> nothing compared to the rowing <laughs> well, yeah. yeah you could say that yeah definitely forgive my roughness well you've been in my campaign trail for a long time i've always been very authentic i'm not the yes. uh, you know, and the, the fine love kind of guy. <laughs> that's, what, that's, what, that's what I love. Like, I, I think the reason why, so just to give context, the reason why I, um, I chose you to, to speak to is because when we were on your campaign, tra campaign trail, it was so authentic and I got to learn so much about you, your journey, the people yeah. around you as well. And I just thought when it comes to people looking into a journey into politics, you would be a really good person to explain, you know, your journey and you would just be really real. <laughs> and that's very kind. Um, so, yes. So, Happy to help. so the first question I wanted to ask is why, why did, why politics? Why did you decide to, to um, go into that um, career? Well, the first thing to say, and thanks again for having me on board. Like the first thing to say is that it was not a natural journey. I, I wasn't, I didn't wake up one day as a kid and go, I want to, be a politician i it started with the fact that i was a volunteer teacher at university and i just felt this satisfaction in wanting to make an uh, impact with young people but also realized that when i was a teaching assistant how there were so many systematic changes that needed to be done and i was frustrated by the inability at a higher level at a larger level at a policy level of anything changing at least from what i could see on the ground as a teaching assistant and so from there i changed my career from originally actually going into banking after graduating to joining the civil service mm -hmm. and so that was the first step so i started to work in government policy and that was very good and the people were very nice but again i felt frustration frustration at the you know the, the slow pace of change the risk adverse nature of um, the institutions that we worked in. So I changed tack again. So I then joined the uh, kind of the nonprofit sector to lobby and advocate for policy change in that way, like a think tank kind of thing. And that was more effective. And then I guess can, you can see the journey kind of grad, gradually moving into the direction where maybe I should give it a go in uh, politics. But you know, politics is a very strange game. It's very, very, very inaccessible and it's extremely hard. And that's the beauty of democracy, but also it's challenged. And so I guess you could argue that to be a decision maker, you really have to earn it. How did you decide what party you wanted to run, um, to be a part of? Um, I had a lot of mentors who kind of happened to bring me into the family, as it were. And I think the most important part of activism is the human to human nature of it. It's being able to hang out with these guys, realize that they're not the stereotypes that people say that uh, they often are, to enjoy uh, having a, a non-alcoholic drink, because I don't drink, um, with them, to see the volunteering activities that they do. You know, I, you know, I was brought into a lot of these events because of, of like I was invited to these because I worked in policy um, areas in it. and I, I when I ran the charity I went to all three political parties so it was not the case that I I was only exposed to one area I went to the Liberal Democrat Party I went to the Labour Party and I see great strengths in all of them and I'm glad that there's a strong girl anyway opposition leader now okay. um, but I respect them you know I respect them but for me, it's the, yeah, I'm really happy with my choice. There are challenges ahead, I'm sure. Um, you know, they're like, oh, you know, the government's crap or like the, the you know, the MP suck or whatever. I'm like, what are you going to do about it? Are you just going to sit here and moan about it while you make money? And, you know, most of my friends are working corporates, right? So they, some of them on the left and they moan about how, you know, it's income inequality and, and in the unfairness of the tax system or unfair that there's poverty in the streets. I'm like, well, you're, you're making rich people richer. So I don't know what you're talking about. You either go out there and try out, try out public service or, 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 you know, don't moan about it because I'm trying and it's hard. There are various different routes. I see different people, different positions within parliament. Does everybody choose the MP route and then they are assigned different routes if they don't become an MP? How does it work? Different people have different paths to becoming an MP. But my, one of the things I always advise people who want to run including telling myself is that, you know, run because you want to do something, not because you want to be something. 
because it don't don't chase the title it's not worth the title it's like what i tell people if they want to start a business don't do it for the riches don't do it for the rewards do it for because you really want to reform something do it because you can feel that you'll be the right person to really push for something um and i've met a lot of mps in my time and i am always drawn by the individuals who have been so dedicated and inspired but there are others who are who are less that and i get frustrated because i think you know i i i see mp some mp's they do their day jobs but they also have a lot of side hustles i'm like this, i don't understand why you have a side hustle because you're getting paid right for your so it should be a full time job and it should be a honor and a privilege to serve your constituents and i you know these kind of things makes me frustrated but as a pragmatist i'm like okay you're frustrated what are you going to do about it what are you yeah. going to do about it i all my friends around me a lot of them and most of my friends are not political right and i think that's really good i think that gives me that down to earth balanced feeling um you know they're like oh you know the government's crap or like the the you know the mp suck or whatever i'm like what are you going to do about it are you just going to sit here and moan about it while you make money and you know most of my friends are working in corporates right so they some of them on the left and they moan about how you know it's income inequality and and you know, the unfairness of the tax system or unfair that there's poverty in the streets i'm like well you're you're making rich people richer so i don't know what you're talking about you either go out there and try out try out public service or, or or you know don't moan about it because i'm trying and it's hard you know it's really hard but i'm trying you know it's it's absolutely been a challenge it's not good for one's normal career but i don't regret it for a second because you know uh some some things you got to fight for and uh it's definitely i've learned a lot throughout the experience i've lost a bit of hair but overall <laughs> it's totally worth it <laughs> yeah and you mentioned you mentioned um about mentors how did, did those mentors come about was it because of your work in the civil service so my advice to especially younger people is you what you need to do is specialize in one or two subject areas right because you're younger you don't have to it's impossible to have the time to be good at like 20 different things you might get that over you know as you get more experience but so what i specialize in education reform um and by being good at education reform you then go to um events that relate to that area and you go to including parliamentary events and you start being known for that and by that nature you you have policy influences in that ecosystem that are also connected and i think it's through those kind of conversations that um that i get i i suppose i meet more experienced colleagues i think there is this notion that um often like oh i need to find a mentor so i need to call somebody and say can you officially be a mentor yeah. and i think that to me is too formalized it's more like a um a friendship where you greatly respect your colleague and you but we both learn from each other and i always often like it when we work on a shared endeavor right so at the time my endeavor was to create not just a career center in every college and university but a enterprise uh, center in every college unit because i think every young person should have the opportunity to learn to create a startup and not just go into a a, a job and i think that really helped and then i start looking at other things which i think i could have a unique voice in which was uh, i guess british chinese community stuff again being uh i don't maybe not the word specialized but I was certainly like trying to own a subject area and again that brings in a whole different journey so um i think that would be my advice really so yes have mentors but the key is why are you having the mentors and and don't just take when you get a mentor it's about sharing a a joint endeavor and that really helps how important is it to be empathetic and to like people in 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 politics how important is it i think it's i think it's essential to the job but um i would caveat it by saying that um that doesn't mean necessarily you have to be like an extrovert and one of the weird things i've learned from social distancing is that i i i believe that the world we live in is naturally leaning towards being extrovert right because it's about glad handling so meeting people in politics is like three times that amount but um now that we're social distancing being able to be comfortable with your own company um and being able to drive your own task on your own is actually a massive strength um and one of the things i love about our democratic system is that it should be very inclusive and it should be able to bring a wide range of personality personalities in and 
you know, Theresa May as prime minister is very different to Boris Johnson, but they both made it to the top through different styles. Mm -hmm. And I think that's good. In fact, I think one of the challenges we have in terms of the way we do things from a democratic standpoint is that we, we love speeches almost too much. What we want to do is also measure the performance of candidates who are able to make competent decisions, who are able to write well, who are able to be diligent with their commitments and that kind of stuff, which I think in a lot of normal, you know, I, I worked, I led policy for a large um, recruitment company. And that's the kind of measurements that people do value. And that's the kind of measurements that the voters would value, right? Not someone that can just make great speeches. So uh, moving on from that, I think a good link actually is to look at the, um, the public um, idea of politicians, because I think yeah. um, it would be good to get an understanding of what you think, because there is an idea that politici politicians don't stick to their truth or they don't tell the truth. That's what in general mm -hmm. people feel that way. I hear a lot of speeches and I, I sometimes from, from certain people, I can see that they really mean it, but it seems yeah. that it doesn't come to come to pass. So um, right. why is that? And um, yeah, is that something that you've had to, to think about when you have a run as well, that not everything you will do will actually happen? or say, sorry, will actually happen? Well, gosh, that's a very um, important and complex question. I think you're absolutely right in the sense that some people are particularly frustrated when they see politicians speak in a ro robotic manner, you could argue, or, or very kind of carefully crafted lines. Um, and certainly when I worked under Theresa May's government, I, I think that was particularly uh, vivid. I think it's, I, it's not, it's, it's hard. It's hard. And it's partly crafted by how the media landscape works. The we politicians eventually become very cautious because we are under so much pressure to not make a mistake. The moment we make a mistake, we get absolutely crushed. Um, and we are also expected. And one of the things I was not prepared for when I got selected is you, be, you suddenly have to become a policy expert or at the minimum be policy aware on everything, you know, like everything. Um, not just in terms of your constituency, but just in terms of everything. And of course, that's not realistic, right? Because we're all just normal human beings. And, you know, I was an expert in education policy and maybe a little bit on um, international policy, but I'm not a planning expert. Nor, nor, and now I had a, had a lot of questions about planning. Like, unless you're like a local councillor on the planning committee, 99.999% of the population, I know nothing about planning, right? I, I didn't build my house. And... You only worry about it when you want to do a loft conversion or something, right? So it's, and, and so you become quite dependent on the lines that you've been given by central government. The second is I do have some sympathy with the reason why we have to have uh, message discipline because to cut through the noise, we all have to have a unified position and it's a team sport. And I, I completely get that. And if, in fact, if you don't have message discipline, you will never be elected because it's chaos. And the reason why I have you know, sympathy is because I ran companies and organizations organization before, and I think it's very important that behind the scenes you have lively debates, but outside you do have these um, debates. Now, in terms of communication, how to make that more empathetic, I think the most important thing is to be on top of your brief. And if you're able to understand fundamentally what you're trying to do, then uh, you'll be able to come across better. It's when you're unprepared that it comes off a bit off. Mm -hmm. And I also think it's very important, and this is my own weakness, which is that I, I, I like to be liked, as it were. I don't, I'm, I'm a nice guy, right? I'm not used to the fact that people hate, <laughs> hate on me. And um, you become, and there's, you know, there's two ways that people react when, when, when you get some hostility. You either become quite defensive, and I'm not, I'm not really, that's not normally me. I normally go more like submissive. I more go kind of like, oh, no, no, okay, let me take that away and be a bit nice about it. A bit, you know, that kind of slightly awkward Britishness. Oh, oh, gosh, okay, well, I'm sorry to hear that. And I think I need to change a little bit. I think I need to have a bit more like, I need to fight back a little bit more. And I've learned that in that campaign, which is to, if you believe in something, you've got to defend it. And you win arguments with better arguments. Mm. And sometimes the reason why people don't understand your position is because the position is complicated or it takes too long to articulate. So we've got to figure out a better way to communicate. And it's not, uh, you know, like the, the voters out there, they don't have, they have lives, right? They don't spend all this time analyzing each policy area. 
Um, so I have, I, I, you know, it's the duty of, of people like myself to articulate it better, mm -hmm. but also the duty to acknowledge when things aren't quite going right, because writing policy on a piece of paper is very different to how it would work um, on the ground. So yeah, but hey, people, people are, well, we always need to get it right. Uh, and it takes time and I need to, I am developing and I have developed my own style. And sometimes you need different people to give different, different angles of the same argument to, yeah. to really land. And you can't convince everybody. That's, that's 100%. You, you, you just yeah. can't convince everybody, no matter what you say. So it was to be extremely loud and to throw bricks. And even though like the nationally we were in government, you know, I looked at myself as a kind of an insurgent, kind of uh, uh, insurgent kind of guerrilla warfare kind of party where I was trying to make throw bricks, throw them, um, tweet people and, and, and waste their resources and energy. Um, and, and I think that worked very well. Earlier on, you mentioned that um, even though you can, even though you can come across as quite, um that you don't want to be confrontational and um you've also mentioned a few things that give us an idea about your personality when it comes down to who you are as an individual when you were campaigning when you yeah. were when you had to you know have debates do you feel like there was an essence of losing a bit of yourself or were you able to completely be yourself throughout this, that period so i mean that's a really great question and i would say that I wouldn't have been selected and I wouldn't have ran if I couldn't be myself. And I think that's really important. So when I did the, so there was a selection meeting to become the conservative candidate for Hampstead and Kilburn. And I had to go in front of a hundred people and I was an outsider. I was against a local candidate. It was very scary. I didn't, I didn't like know anyone on the field. I only had my, my girlfriend who, was sat at the back BDI going, yay, thumbs up. I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shit myself, you know? So it's, a, it's really scary. And I, the reason why I won was because I didn't have any notes and I just freewheeled and talked about my own journey. And I said, and you know, this was a time when a lot of commentators were thinking we would be, the Tory party was going more to the right, right? And I was like, I'm an unashamed moderate. I'm an unashamed social liberal. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm gonna do. And if you don't like that, don't vote for me. Like, don't, don't choose me because that's what I'm going to do. And the way I described the campaign that I was going to run, I think that the campaign that we ultimately did run was that I'm going to treat it like a social entrepreneurial journey. And I believe the candidate needs to lead that. The energy of the candidate makes the campaign successful, not through a campaign manager, not through any other individual. You have to own the, and embody that campaign. And I think, and I, again, it's exactly the same if you ran a startup. I think if you don't believe in the startup, it, just, it would just die. Yeah. It would just die. And I think one of the reasons why some of the YouTube videos went viral was because it sounded authentic. And you can ask anyone. I'm a, I'm a, I, I'm a crap actor. I can't act for the life of me. I can't even comb my hair. So I just say what I believe in. But um, I say it, what I believe in, not in a kind of undisciplined manner, but because those views were forged over many, many years. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that every single policy is completely aligned with the values or whatever. Like, it's, there are nuances and there are complications because we're a very broad church. But overall, you know, I was really proud of the campaign we ran. And, and more, more importantly, I'm really proud of the people that I met and the people that stuck with me. And we had a lot of activists who sat in my office unpaid for hours and hours on the hand. You know, we're a small campaign. We were against, if you looked at some of the spending, we were like, I think the, the Brexit party spent more money than us on ads. I wanted to talk about your social media um, presence <laughs> <laughs> uh, because you created so many videos and it got thousands of views. Um, I, I think compared to a lot of uh, other people that were campaigning at the time, we just... It's, just surpassed, surpassed a lot of people. How important do you think it is to have a social media presence during your campaign? And also, what are the benefits, but also the um, the drawbacks as well um, from for having such a big presence? Absolutely. So, um, social media is fun. It's hard. You do make mistakes, and you do expose yourself. And I had to experiment with like a wide range of different mediums. Um, and it depends on your audience. So uh, most of my successes were on Twitter. 
Now, the, the drawback of Twitter is that I actually think it's quite hard to uh, win lots of votes on Twitter because most people are not on Twitter, especially the older folks. But my primary objective on being very loud on things like Twitter was to pin my opponents into my constituency. The second was to make sure that the, the newspapers, the local papers, treated my campaign with credibility and not create a dynamic where it was Labour versus the Lib Dems. Um, because if they did that, I would just be out of the picture and I would have certainly come third, like a third. I would 100% come third. So it was to be extremely loud and to throw bricks. And even though like the nationally we were in government, you know, I looked at myself as a kind of a insurgent kind of uh, uh, insurgent kind of guerrilla warfare kind of party where I was trying to make throw bricks, throw them, um, tweet people and, and, and waste their resources and energy. Um, and, and I think that worked very well. So I would campaign till uh, 9 p.m. I'll come home at 10 p.m. I would then edit the things I filmed between 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. I would then sleep for four, five hours, wake up, send my emails in the morning, then campaign in Barnet, and in the afternoon, go back to Hampstead. Mm -hmm. That's what I did for about six weeks. And, and then between that, I also had to do my day job. They were, you know, I took the last two weeks off for holiday, but I had to do my day job as well to keep the bills going. So, yeah, I mean, that was tough. But um, I think people just found the videos kind of funny. And actually, the hardest part of the videos was adding subtitles. <laughs> like, yeah, that, that took the longest. Yeah. I, I know some of my colleagues who spent thousands of pounds getting a professional videographer to, you know, do a video. But I just kind of did it myself. And that, because I'm a cheap ass, you know, I'm a cheapo. So <laughs> I want to... But it's I wanna... because it, you, you doing it that way meant that you could just do it on your own time. And that's why you were able to just keep producing, producing so many, um, totally. rather than, you know, get somebody professional. But it looked professional. They all look Thank you. So you Thank did you. a really good job. That's I was like a vlogger. You know, that's how we found you and to do the Oh, thank you. Thank you. you know, um, who, who is really engaging with people online um, and we liked your personality. So yeah, it's, yeah. Thank it's you. Great. Thank you. I mean, there's some really crazy stories. Like I grabbed my, you know, like, you know, Casey Neistat when he has the gorilla pod and the camera, I took, a, I took a camera and I went to the prime minister, like, because we were, um, I was, I was given a 10 minute slot PM and I just grabbed the camera. I was like, don't talk to me, prime minister. Just re just, I want you to like, tell me about how awesome I am on front of this camera, because it, if it isn't in the video, it never happened. It never happened. <laughs> and he was like, okay. <laughs> and then all his like security guards and his press team were like, what the heck's, what the heck's going on? Like, but yeah. Um, and I did that with Sajid Javid. And I did so much of it that I think cabinet ministers wanted to be in the video. So, you know, Matt Hancock came and all these, you know, like all these other MPs and parliamentaries were, were interested in what I was up to because I was having fun. And, you know, like if you're going to do this, you're going to have to have fun because you're not doing it for anything else. Yeah. There's no upside, especially for a seat where it was very difficult to win. Like I was realistic about my chances in, in my head, uh, but I had to appear like I was fighting all the way. Yeah. Uh, and I did. And how did you deal with um, like the criticism that you faced during the campaign, um, maybe online? I mean, in general, anybody that is campaigning yeah. will face it. But if you have a big presence online, that's more, more chance for people to feed back in, in some way. So how did you deal totally. with it? So I think there are like, um, there's a, there's a, so I tried and I, I was under pressure by some activists to kind of go really mudslinging. And I try not to do that where, where possible. Um, you know, I would antagonize when necessary, but I would never kind of be over the top. Um, I think there's kind of two buckets of criticism. There's a policy criticism and I'm, uh, that's fine. Like I understand if there's a policy difference and I'm very, having spent five years in the civil service, I can explain policy quite well. I can explain Brexit policy. I can explain the deficit cutting program. I can, I can do that. And I, that's my strength. And I, I, that's why I love the debates because I can go into the detail. The yeah. bit that I found very hard was when it's very personal and especially if it's something to do with things I can't control. So for, you know, I had a lot of stuff about my race and, you know, people were in, some people were inferring me with like the Chinese communist government. And I'm like, I, you know, like I, I never lived in China. You know, my mom's Taiwanese for a start. Um, I was born in Hong Kong under British soil at the time. And it's the same, I see such parallels between that accusation, especially from the, the, the momentum activists from you know, anti-Semitism, because there's a lot of people who are 
who are crapping on the the Jewish population in UK because of Israeli foreign policy. And I'm like, that there was two are not linked. You just happen to look like them. You happen to have heritage there, but they're not the same thing. And so that's why I, I was very angry and very passionate about my defense of the um, the, the Jewish diaspora and the constituent, not necessarily, not just because it was wrong and it needed to be defended, but because I, I can, I have some kind of, I can feel some of the same frustrations that I was getting. And, you know, the British Chinese community is very small in the UK and we, we, we get enough crap as it is. And so um, I found that quite a lonely journey, to be honest. But um, yeah, it was tough. But, you know, like I learned that like if you don't make, I've spent most of my life being this quiet Chinese guy at school and uni. And I realized that you don't make waves unless you are willing to stick your head above the parapet and take some heat. And if you're strong enough with your convictions, then it's fine. Thank you very much. Um, very you're insightful. Welcome. Is there anything uh, you, you think that we haven't spoken about that you think will help somebody when they're thinking about going into politics? Is there anything else um, while we wrap, before we round up? So given the fact that there is a pandemic going on and it is a very strange time and it is a tough time, I think it's very important that we make use of this period of time, both in terms of um, having a bit of calmness in the time when I found it very difficult to have calmness. I think it's important to sit down and reflect and refresh your ambitions and your plans and also to try not to be totally addicted to tech. But second is to, it's a reminder that in our time in this planet is really short and I know it's cheesy, but it is short and I think it's so important for us to take risk and to do things that we really care about. And it doesn't have to be politics, it could be anything that we want to do. Um, Because ultimately, the world is created through institutions. And it's so much easier to just follow a institutional path, which is going to university, getting a normal job, seeking promotion. It's what society has taught us to do, but it doesn't necessarily make you happy. And in my career, I've jumped and I've done different things. I've tried to push and change that and I've had some scrapes I've had some bruises but it's totally worth it because ultimately like who are you trying to please don't please anyone but you know what your heart tells you to do so yeah that's my advice like you I'm hoping by when we have a vaccine next year that we'll get is a massive catalyst of pent-up energy that will want us to do different things like we can't go back to the status quo right and we won't go back to status quo it's up to all of us to rebuild the country and the economy and um, i hope that we'll get that energy because we're going to need it um, uh, once this pandemic's over